Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, The Last Nighters, and The Last Nighters are part of the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Tonight we're going to be doing an episode on The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. It's a movie that came out, it's on Netflix, it's by the Coen Brothers, and it is a recommendation by my co-host Robert. He really enjoyed it. This is episode 61 of the show, and you can find show notes and more at lastnighters.com slash 61. If you like what we do here, you can support us on Patreon at lastnighters.com slash Patreon. How you doing, Robert, before we get into that Google description? I'm lovely, Daniel. My horse, Daniel. That's weird, but yes, I'm glad that you're lovely. That's Buster Scruggs' horse. His name is Dan. So you're my you're my horse for the episode, buddy. All right, I I will be your your pack animal for this one. Here is the description: The Ballad of Buster Scruggs came out 2018, drama comedy, two hours and 13 minutes. 91% of Google users like it. 7.3 on the IMDb, 91% Rotten Tomatoes, and four out of four from the old RogerEbert.com. Though he's been dead for a while, so I don't think it's from him. Uh, the description is very brief. An anthology of six short films that take place in 19th century post-Civil War era during the settling of the Old West. Came out November 16th of last year. Ethan and Joel Cohen got an Academy Award for Best Writing and Adapted Screenplay. And uh, it swerves from goofy to ghastly so deftly and so often that you can't always tell which is which, according to A.O. Scott of the failing New York Times. Robert, your thoughts so far? Well, I'm glad the Coens got you know, nodded, like acknowledged that this movie and their work on it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Oscars. I don't really care what the uh, entertainment Oscar industry nominates or gives accolades to. Their their opinions matter matter far, far less to me. As more I age, I, I see that their tastes do not line up with mine. I think they gave the best movie award to like Green something, Green Door, Green Day. I don't know. Not, not, not something I'm interested in. Anyway, uh, uh, this movie though was fantastic, and I'm glad they got nominated uh, and won. That's that's cool. But yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot to say. It's it's six little short stories, and their mastery of character really shows because they don't need a whole lot of time. Some movies you don't even like a character throughout the entire film, and they never connect with the audience. These guys can get you to connect with a character in like two minutes, three minutes tops. Because each of these, like they're less than a half hour, they're about what, like 20 minutes long on average. So they got to, they don't have a lot of time to waste. And I felt something in almost every single one of them. I'm not going to spoil which one I didn't really connect with until later on. But yeah. All right. That's fair stuff. enough. That's fair enough. And one of our Patreon supporters who is watching the live stream now has commented, this is the anarchist mom. She says the movie we're discussing is Green Book, a Spike Lee joint. And uh, I'm going to channel my David Spade here. I liked it better the first time when it was called Driving Miss Daisy. Nice. I, I don't know much about the movie other than there's a guy driving around another guy and they go around and play music or something. Yeah, and it's got uh, Viggo Mortensen, you know, the old Return of the King. He's in there. Sweet. Is he fighting so around? Uh, the Sauron of Bigotry, I think, uh, in the South. I, I don't know much about it. I saw the uh, the trailer. And um, there were all sorts of people writing um, articles about how they were disappointed the Green Book won for some reason. And it should have been Black Panther, I guess. <laughs> I don't really I, know. It's, it's hilarious that Black Panther... This is, a, this is where I... It's, you can't be more obvious in that the academy is just like trying to pander because black panther is not like a phenomenal film i mean it won it probably deserves to win for costume design maybe or at least to get nominated for costume design but it got nominated for all kinds of stuff like song and i don't know best picture i think it was nominated for it's ridiculous ridiculous yeah and then the articles that i saw that were saying green book shouldn't have won it was they were picking on it because it was like a story of like redemption and in racial tensions or something like that i mean i haven't seen green book so i don't really know but they're like picking on it in sort of a virtue signally way but i i don't know it's just it's beyond me it's it's pandering and and it's nonsense and it's the hero nobody wanted you know the virtue signaler yeah um, writing this crap anyway we're not here to talk about green book we're here to talk about the ballad of buster scruggs which has six little vignettes like you said uh six little uh, uh pretty maids all in a row so why don't we just bing bang boom uh or bing bang boom uh all the way down from the very first one let's open with buster scruggs himself robert yeah so we we open on buster who's singing a tune atop his horse daniel and he's a uh, rootin' tootin' cowboy kind of guy but he's also a singing singing like man i guess you could call him and he's a bit of an outlaw a white and hat outlaw but yeah what's that a little bit of a white hat like uh, squeaky clean style like yeah uh, i mean he's wanted but we don't really know why but he's the kind of guy he's a he's a famous gun shooter right so people would challenge him to gunfights and this is 
I mean, I don't know how much of this really happened in the Old West, but let's just say that I wouldn't necessarily be against a world where everyone's armed and you need to be polite to other people because if you know, a whole bunch of insults start flying, they could go, hey, all right, let's settle this outside. And by settle this outside, I don't mean we're going to punch each other in the face. I mean, we're going to shoot each other and there's going to be one of us alive at the end of it. That would ensure a pretty darn peaceful, like respectful interactions among, at least among men. I mean, probably there's not a whole lot of lady gunfighters, but there might be, I don't know. But- well, now, now there probably would be or transgender gunfighters. But um, I, I do want to say that the conceptions that most people have uh, regarding the, the Old West being the Wild West is mostly a product of Hollywood film. And in reality, there were far fewer bank robberies and gunfights than there is in like modern day Cleveland. Um, and there's a, um, I think a book that's called The uh, Not So Wild West. And there's some articles related to it. I'll post those on our show notes page at lastnighters.com slash 61 um, that kind of dis- disabuse people of that conception that they have that has been kind of fed to them through media and entertainment. Yeah, it's funny how a culture needs kind of its own mythology. Like the United States is not a very old, at least Western culture, United States is not a very old society. I mean, we're a few hundred years old and we've kind of mythologized this something that's barely a hundred years old, but it is, it speaks to an era of time where, you know, men were really manly. And I think we've probably, I think you could imagine that we've lost a little bit of that. Maybe a touch. Uh, Maybe just a touch, a little bit, a little bit of soy, a little bit of estrogen in the water. You know what I'm saying? But uh, so, yeah, there's a, a certain amount of mystique and um, honesty and romanticism to this movie and in Westerns in general that is appealing to the to the man in me. All right. Well, that's good. Um, what are some of the things in this first vignette that stood out to you as discussion points? I, I had a few in mind. Uh, one was the very first interaction when he enters that bar and he orders a whiskey and he says, the bartender says, this is a dry county. And right. well, it's just like, well, what are they drinking over there? Whiskey. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they don't want to drink with him because he looks like he's a law abiding, like white hat kind of a guy. And right. Then bust- and then what did you think about when the guy asked him if his shooting iron works and Buster just shoots him in the head? He's like, yep, guess it works. I, well, th- I thought it was a little bit over the line. Well, the guy was threatening him. He was threatening him by asking him a question, I suppose. But did it really warrant getting shot in the head at that moment? I don't know about that. Yeah, that's a tough one. I think that the intention was that they were going to attack him and there was a group of them there. So it was a little bit um, like saying it without saying it. Yeah. I mean, he was definitely outnumbered. I, so maybe he felt like threatened and he needed to take the advantage, like take it to the offense in order to survive in that situation. Right. Because that guy wasn't de-escalating the situation. He was escalating the situation. Right. And they probably felt confident. I mean, we're talking about this if it was real, but you know what I mean? Like they probably in that situation, they felt they had the numbers, you know, they were all armed. They probably had a, a decent chance of just taking care of this guy. No problem. Or at least scaring him. But this is Buster Scruggs we're talking about. And he's a rootin' tootin' cowboy. And he's going to gun them all down without breaking a sweat. Yeah, he's highly specialized, very, very skilled in this. And that uh, that becomes a, a relevant point towards the end of the vignette. Because he, um, I mean, I, I don't want to like, we can still talk about a little bit in the middle of it. But by the end, a, a challenger comes up. And he's not afraid of him. Because he's like, well, I'm super talented. I'm super good. I, I'm well practiced. And uh, he's just a hair too slow. And that's it. That's the end. Yeah, he meets he meets someone better than him and you live by the sword you die by the sword it's uh it's a fun little moral of the story i suppose yeah and and also that even as good as you are you know there's always somebody out there who who has a chance to be better you know so it's uh, it's not so much the competition in like the economic sense like we talk about often you know businesses competing with each other on price or quality to satisfy consumers this is more of a athletic style competition you know like who's the best at certain abilities and certain things like that but it, it sort of plays a bit of a role for me but the other thing I wanted to talk about, this, the kind of the meat in the sandwich here of the first vignette is when he enters the bar, the second bar in town, and they have a, a check your guns policy, no guns in the house allowed. And he goes and plays the poker game. And let's talk through that a little bit. Yeah. So he sits down at the poker and a guy had just left. And but the hand is still there. And they say that you need to play his hand if you want to sit down at this table. And he looks at it and the hand is aces and eights. And he goes, well, I don't want to play this hand. 
now normally aces and eights is a great hand two pair two two big pair at least aces is top pair obviously and then another pair is going to beat most hands you're going to lose to straights full houses flushes but it's rare that you're going to go up against two bigger pair than that it's it's a fantastic hand but this is known, it's known as the dead man's hand the one by wild bill kickcock where he was shot in the head while playing aces and eights in um was that deadwood north dakota so i guess where they're playing off that is kind of fun little reference but when the um i don't know the other characters i don't know if he has a name I think he probably does but the character that he gets into an argument with um says you know you have to play that hand and buster goes you know no no man can compel another man to engage in recreation which i think is a fun line and i think it really speaks to the libertarian in me that yeah no man can tell another man that he's got to have fun with this thing or play that thing or do that thing. Good for you, Buster. Live free. Yeah, I'd expand it to just about anything. Uh, yeah. Not just recreation, but yeah. Yeah, definitely a, a very strong message there. Now, I, I, I too forget the guy's name, uh, but they sing a whole song about him and how he was grumpy and now he's dead. Yeah. So and and he deserves to die. I mean, I don't know why the establishment didn't have like a bouncer, but for some reason this guy gets away with having a concealed firearm and pulls it out and points it at Buster. And at that point, Buster is well within his rights to do whatever he can to get out of that situation alive. And I thought it was so funny the way that he ends up killing the guy. I mean, oh, it's completely it's like a cartoon. Like, yeah, it is. But before we do that, I I like his line like, "Oh, uh would you mind depositing your firearm up at the front because that's the policy of the house here." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is absolutely the way you know a perfectly reasonable thing it's their private property they've got certain rules and that's what would attract clientele or, or dis disincentivize clientele but the idea that they're gonna they want to have a firearm free place i'm perfectly okay with that so so yeah so there so so yeah he um he uses the table uh and the loose boards in the table to hit Get him to shoot himself car. three times in the head <laughs> which is ridiculous it's a completely ridiculous cartoon thing but it takes me si so by so by surprise that you're like oh okay so this is kind of a cartoon okay and then and then the rest of the movie is like played straight so there's no like cartoon stuff after this but this little bit i think plays and it it, it works yeah i mean the whole like first vignette has a bunch of cartoony stuff kind of peppered into it you know you got the him dusting himself off when he walks in and the cloud of dust stays in the shape of him as he walks away from it yeah and it's then, like very bugs bunny yeah yeah wily e. coyote type stuff roadrunner and then when when uh, he ends up losing in in his uh shootout he starts flying off with angel wings singing a duet with the guy who shot him yeah and then he and then you know he said like what would you say what that the, the distance was like 100 yards maybe or 50 yards at least and he's shooting the guy's fingers off one at a time and then he pulls out the mirror and then he does the behind the back shoot trick shot right into the guy's heart yeah it's totally a cartoon nobody shot that well nobody i don't care if you're annie oakley and she used a rifle at least but a pistol at that distance no nah, i'm sorry see more cartoony stuff and, and that's just also how good he was now i gotta ask um he's it's not credited but was that a cameo by jack black of uh, which character the the brother of the, the guy who got shot from the poker game and challenged Buster to a shootout and got his finger shot off. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. If that was Jack Black, he was, didn't sound like Jack Black or look like Jack Black. Uh, maybe I'm high. I, <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was Jack Black the whole time. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's anything else you want to say on that first one? I think I, I've covered all my points. I got all my points. That was just, it's just a fun way to kick off the show. Um, you really get to know the character right off the bat. Um, he seems to have to be a happy person. You know, he's really introducing the whole show and just, I don't know, get, got me in the mood for the rest of the episodes. It was fantastic. All right. So we mosey on down the trail to, uh, down near Algodones. And this is a young cowboy fixing to rob a bank from Milton from office space. Yeah. It's, um, what's his name? Uh, Franco. Yeah. James Franco robbing a bank out in the middle of nowhere. And you're going, well, who's who's needs a bank out in the middle of nowhere? What kind of clientele are they servicing? But then I guess the dialogue, he kind of explains it, that they get like travelers and whatnot. But man, is Milton, the actor, does such a great job in this little bit. He doesn't have a lot to do, but he's such a character. I mean, everybody's just such a character. It's fantastic. Yeah. So this is Steven Root, and he's uh, basically telling the bank robber like, oh, yeah, you know, with the last couple of times we tried to get robbed, uh, I ended up killing one of the guys. And, and then the second time I shot the guy in the leg and had to hold him in the vault for like a month uh, until the, the marshals came by. <laughs> So he was like sort of um, he knew what was going on and he was like letting the bank robber know, hey, I have the ability to defend myself. You know? Yeah, it was great dialogue, great subtext it, all throughout that dialogue. Like, yeah, I can see you're packing and you probably shouldn't try it. 
but Franco doesn't get the get the hint and uh, thinks he's better, and he goes and robs the place anyway, and just uh, just barely dodges about three shotgun blasts. Yeah, they're they're like down at knee level, like behind the counter, right? And he fires those off, and then right. uh, 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 St- uh, Stephen Root uh, disappears on him. He buggers off, and so Franco's like, okay, gets all the money, and then he's making his way out to his horse when he gets shot in the back or winged or whatever he goes down and then he scrubbles behind a, a well and then here he comes here comes the banker out wearing pots and pans which is a great nod to what what is it the good the bad and the ugly where eastwood wears that plate shirt and has the bad guys shoot him in the chest like six times oh yeah so, yeah like uh, early iron man style i guess pan shot but yeah pan shot you're terrible and then uh i like how james franco doesn't think he fights fair and he has this complaint is those are his last words before he gets hung by these guys. Now, what do you think about this form of justice? I mean, basically, Franco is unconscious the entire time they're having this supposed trial. And he wakens up, you know, wakes up to find himself noose around the tree. And they're like, well, we had the trial. We found you guilty. Do you have any last words? Yeah, it's a... Uh, I mean, it was obvious it was him who had done the, the crime. And he was trying to murder the Stephen Root character, Milton. So... Right. If there's a, any level of justice, you know, I I think that they didn't have to do the jury of his peers and do the whole defend yourself kind of stuff. I mean, they knew they knew who it was. But the irony of this one is that uh, this posse gets attacked by Indians out of the clear blue sky, out of nowhere. Instantly, out of nowhere, they they're sitting there in the middle of the prairie and they can see like five to ten miles all the way around uninterrupted view but all of a sudden it's this indian comanche attack just out of nowhere but I, I i give it a pass i don't care it's great yeah and then they they leave him alive but they they also know that his horse uh is he's on the horse and his horse is trying to feed and it gets further and further away like stretching his neck out and you know they know he's eventually going to die but then some some rancher finds him and he rides with the rancher guy and then right. another posse catches him. And apparently that guy was a cattle rustler. Right. He takes off and Franco gets busted for cattle rustling, even though he wasn't cattle rustling. He had no idea. Right. And so th- that irony twist is that he gets hung for a crime he didn't commit. Right. And then and it leads to the best line, the funniest line in the whole movie where Franco turns to the other guy and he's like, first time. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably your first time getting hung. I mean, it's just, you know, you don't happen very often. But um, I don't know. What did you think of the uh, his second trial? Uh, the second he couldn't speak uh, in his own defense. And he's just like, oh, you caught him doing blah, blah, blah. Good enough. Get him, Hang him. Yeah, it almost like uh, <laughs> it's like how they're handing out warrants these days, you know? Right. Oh, you think they might got something in there? Oh, OK, yeah. Here, here's a warrant. Go get him. Yeah. Sounds so like state justice to me. Now, now the, the, the weird thing is like my original response to his first crime was he was definitely the guy who did it. And to the, the posse with the second year of the cattle rustling, he's definitely the guy they caught with the cattle. Yep. But I think they don't distinction because the banker knew it was James Franco robbing him. This is this guy was maybe a receipt of stolen goods without knowing they were stolen goods. Also, at his trial, we don't get to see this, the first trial, but the second trial, there is no plaintiff. There is nobody that says, hey, these are my cattle that were stolen. This is the guy that stole them. So blah, blah, blah. It's just the word of this you know, posse member who says, hey, we caught this guy with these cows. And yes, they are stolen cows. Yeah. So that, that one's a bit of an injustice. And I think that's kind of the point. Right. You know, he, he, get, he narrowly escapes the original one where he was definitely guilty. And then he gets caught in this technicality kind of bullshit thing um, and <laughs> gets, gets justice served uh, for the wrong thing. Yeah, and I think this is, you know, this is the Coens having some fun. I don't really think that trials were like this in the Old West. I mean, maybe there was some, there there are definitely examples in history of vigilante justice and that sort of thing and posses catching people and hanging them from trees. That's definitely a thing that happened. I don't think it happened nearly as often as Hollywood like it say it is. But the secondary trial where there's just some judge sitting on a porch somewhere and they drag a guy in front of them, I doubt that that's really how it happened. Maybe once, but I doubt it happened a whole lot. Yeah, there was a uh, sort of opposite direction of this, but there was uh, an instance, I think, in old San Francisco, you know, old West style San Francisco, where some government official or or some deputy was committing crimes and uh, he was brought to trial and it was a government trial, government run trial. And he got off, of course, you know, because that's like how they do things. Right. They they let their own off. Uh, But because the government hadn't established itself until somewhat recently at that time, there was already this community style justice system in place. And so they 
responded to the obviously, you know, bullshit result verdict uh, from this guy. And they tried him in their own way and ended up um, <laughs> killing the guy. Uh, there's an article by the principal libertarian that I will post on our show notes page for that one, because that's an interesting story, I think, and a little bit related to this. Very cool. So what did you think of the second one overall? Uh, you know, it's not as cartoony. Well, I mean, there is a cartoony element with the pan shot and all that stuff. And the uh, horse. And the horse. Yeah. I, I, I liked it. I found it enjoyable. It's not as uh, cheeky as the first one, I think. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, it was fun. It was good. Uh, and uh, the next item up for bid is the meal ticket. This is the Liam Neeson and the boy with no limbs. Yeah, the meal ticket. Mm, this is this is a good meaty one. I like it a lot. Um, so watching this the reminded me a lot of P.T. Barnum because it's like an entertainer and he's got this kind of a freak kind of a character who he is using to entertain an audience. And when uh, the Great Entertainer movie came out, I think like a year or two ago. The Greatest Showman, you mean? Yeah, that's it. Um, a lot of the SJW types kind of came out of their holes and snarked about how P.T. Barnum was like this terrible person and how he was taking advantage of these people and exploiting them. And I, I question what exactly they would have wanted to happen. Should these people with unique abilities and unique you know, attributes, should they have not been able to get a job? Should they have had like a normal job or would they, is it okay that they actually use their unique attributes to entertain people or to perform some kind of unique, you know, performance? Because I argue that Liam Neeson in this care in this movie is guilty of one crime, but not the crime of exploiting this no arm, no leg guy. Yeah. Do you agree? Well, it's, it's a little bit blurry by the end of it because he's well, going it's not going to the end of it yet. Right. Okay, so yeah, in the open, I'm like, oh, he's taking care of him. This is a, a a guy who can't provide on his own, so he's using his abilities that he has uh, to be a riveting orator. Um, yeah, it's a symbiotic relationship. Without Liam Neeson, this guy is begging on the side of a road, maybe dead in a ditch. Right. Yeah, they're both benefiting from this, and it's sort of like the uh, the Walmart greeter situation that's going on lately. Like it's been known for a long time that Walmart will hire greeters, and they're like elderly or or differently abled people and that's the job they can do and it like makes guests feel welcome at walmart well apparently um they're uh, they're diminishing that program or not hiring people for it anymore and so now there's people complaining about walmart discarding these people and no longer wanting to employ uh people who can't get (laughs) they can't do anything right right yeah yeah so on the one side they're exploiting them and now now that they're no longer going to hire them apparently uh, now they're bad for that so damned if you do damned if you don't now i would say when liam neeson does abandon this guy he kind of doesn't just abandon them in the kind of way walmart does well it is left a little bit ambiguous a little bit like it's a little we don't actually get to see it but we are left to assume that he straight up murders the guy in fact it's interesting why he murders him daniel Let's talk about why he murders him, because his performance is getting a little bit stale. He's not maintaining, you know, the audience level that they're going to need to sustain themselves. Right. Like he's getting pennies now. He's not innovating as an entrepreneur. He's not innovating his entertainment performances, not keeping up with the times or whatever. And he gets trumped by another performer. Now, you might say that this chicken has like chicken privilege and his beats his cis white male privilege and his no arms, no legs privilege, I guess. I don't know. It's like a triple word score, man. I, I don't know who's more oppressed in this level of whateverness, but maybe it's a transgender chicken. It could be a trans chicken. <laughs> But he gets outperformed by this chicken that can do math. And I don't know if this is a real thing. I I have no idea, but I thought it was hilarious because it would be entertaining. But I think it's funny that Liam Neeson sees it and goes, oh, yeah, this is clearly a big crowd pleaser and I can make a lot of money with this. And instead of, you know, finding a home for his current meal ticket, he's like, well, I just got to get rid of him. And I guess nobody's going to ask any questions and whatever. Yeah. So that's the evil turn, right? That's that's where it goes from. There's the symbiotic relationship where they're mutually benefiting each other and helping each other out to where now he is painted in this by doing this evil deed. Now it now it appears as if he was just exploiting him the whole time. Yeah. As if he didn't care about him, but he clearly 
I mean, they never, we don't get any dialogue where they're actually talking to each other and much, you know, he brings him to a, a whorehouse and doesn't allow him or doesn't buy him some loving as they say, but it's not clear that he could have been able to. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he's doing everything else for this guy. He's putting his makeup on. He's helping him go to the bathroom. He's cleaning up after him. He's feeding him. He's doing everything possible that nobody else is doing or offering to do that we can see. But then when he a better offer comes along, yeah, he gets rid of him in the worst way you could do. Yeah, no. yeah he would have an obligation, right? I would, I would say that he has an obligation to at least, not necessarily to find him another person to take care of him, but at least leave him in an area where you know, there are at least other people where the, the possibility, like leave him at a church or something. Yeah, isn't right? that the uh, Walter Block argument? about, you know, Rothbard was like, we don't have any positive obligations. This includes to your own children and, and Block's nuance to that is, well, you have to make others aware that there is someone who's not going to be able to care for themselves and they're available to be cared for. Yeah, I've heard the uh, Dave Smith makes this point where, you know, if you were to have somebody come into your store and then leave, I mean, that's perfectly fine. But if you were to have somebody come into your hot air balloon and then you take them up in a hot air balloon and then you're like, okay, you need to leave now. No, you can't just have them leave right now. You have to take them back down. So when he is out traveling in the middle of the whatever, you can't just like leave him on the side of the road knowing that he's just going to die. You have to drop him off at a place where he has a chance to survive. Right, at minimum. And so I'd argue that, you know, back to his um, taking care of the meal ticket, you know, helping him go to the bathroom, feeding him, bathing him, et cetera. I would argue that those are necessary things, actions that needed to happen for him to still be a meal ticket. Correct. Yeah. And the one example of him not doing something for him, which would have been a friendship camaraderie style thing, was buying him some loving at the whorehouse. And he refused to do that. So that was not something that would have been required. Mm hmm for him to be a meal ticket. It would have been a nice thing that for him to do, or, you know, like buying him a drink or whatever, you know, like something um, celebratory or, or sharing in friendship kind of a thing. Right. So you're saying that this is more of an employee employer relationship. Kind of. of a, instead of two friends, obviously. Right. Yeah. And it's more of like, I'm going to do the minimum amount of required stuff so that our symbiotic relationship functions, but I'm not going to go beyond that at all. Right. But uh, that's not to say he has any kind of obligation to go beyond. No, right? no, absolutely not. But it's just a, a it, it colors the relationship that they have. Right. Now, I would say that it's kind of on the no arm, no leg guy to do what he can to make himself as valuable as possible. Like he is, think of him as skilled labor and he's drawing fewer and fewer crowds. He's got to come up with something. He has to innovate. Right. And, and then, Liam, Liam's got a whole bunch of responsibilities in maintaining him, right? Right. Maintaining this guy. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of expense. And so I'm not get, saying, yeah, I'm not saying he deserves to get murdered, but you're going to get beat by a chicken. Is what I'm saying. Right. And, and uh, I, I liken this to improvements in capital equipment. And this sounds really horrific, but basically you've got this um, guy who's creating value. And if you view it in an economic sense, it takes a lot of inputs to keep it going. It's expensive to keep it going. And it's got diminishing returns. And, and some of that, maybe the performance is getting stale, like you were saying, or they're just running out of places to go. Like they're going to smaller and smaller towns, like further and further out. Uh, it's getting into the winter, right? It's getting colder out and people are watching these performances outside. Uh, so you would expect that, yeah, you know, your attendance is going to drop as a result of that. And then he sees this chicken draw in a crowd. Well, the chicken costs hardly anything to maintain. You buy it some feed and you don't need to help it pee and you don't need to spoon feed it and bathe it and all that stuff. So uh, I think... I think it, if you view it in, and again, this is a very dispassionate economic sense, it's an upgrade in the efficiency. Like his goal was to earn money from audiences. So he had the limbless boy, which a lot of expense in maintaining. And now he's got this chicken, super cheap and abundantly uh, uh, entertaining, like attracting crowds and all these things. So he, he's reduced his costs and increased the output significantly. He's essentially automating. That's kind of what a lot of the worker, low, low skilled workers are complaining about these days, that they're afraid robots are going to take their jobs. Yeah, he's up, upgraded the, the equipment that is being used. And again, and it doesn't argue for a pay increase. All it does is eat the same amount of corn all the time. Right. But that doesn't speak to the morality. It, it's only speaking to the calculation of, of Liam Neeson's character. Like, yeah, I've got these expenses and it's we're not making as much money versus, hey, here's an opportunity to make more money and have less cost and less effort expended on my part. Right. And I would say one more thing. I mean, I, I'm obviously not speaking for uh, against the morality of what Liam Neeson's character does, but and we're not, you know, obviously they're writing the story in a certain way 
But if the no arm, no leg guy, should we, can we, can we call him Phil? What do you call guy no arms, no legs in a hole? <laughs> He's going to, what are you, Matt on a, on a thing? Should we just call him Phil? I'm going to call him Phil. So if Phil kind of endeared himself more to Neeson, told him jokes, entertained him, made friends with him. So then Liam Neeson maybe is going to get more value out of his companionship than the chicken's going to be able to provide. So he'd be more likely to keep them both on. But we don't get that. All we get is like a very you know sterile, cold relationship. So it seems more of a burden on him. So then when the chicken comes along, oh, this seems like a way better deal for him. Right, yeah. Now, to speak to the morality, yeah, of course, he does a very evil and dastardly thing that he definitely should not have done. He should have brought, uh, I think his name was Harrison. He should have brought him somewhere um, and said, hey, you know what? It's been great. Uh, I've got this chicken now, so I wish you luck. Uh, here's a town, you know, here's some money or whatever. Uh, see you later. Instead of a- apparently dropping him off a uh, very <laughs> high bridge. But it's got the, the impact, you know? It's got that. It's got a real good bite to the story at the end, which I, I really appreciate. Because if he does just leave him, you know, on a church step, it's not quite the the bite that uh, murder has. Murder, murder. But that's a good one. What did you think of overall of meal ticket? Uh, I think this one it did stood out to me that they were trying to demonize this guy as an exploiter a bit much. Evil and, capitalist. Evil capitalist. Yeah. So this one kind of sat with me a little bit rough. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's all like encapsulated short, you know, they got to get to the point they hit on some emotions pretty quickly. Um, but I, you know, I think the whole thing, all of these were enjoyable. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, like you say, kind of talks like, you know, that capitalism is this cold calculation where as soon as you're no longer as valuable as you possibly could be, you're thrown out with the garbage. And that's not really the case with human beings, but for this movie, um, yeah, I appreciated it for the, the the kind of shock value and the bite to it. So it kind of made the story for me. But yeah, overall, really, really strong. Shall we move on? Let's move on to uh, numero cuatro. This is all Gold Canyon. This is the old grizzled prospector arriving in some uh, beautiful valley. The nature gives way when he enters the valley. And I don't yeah. know if that was like an allusion to man, the destroyer. Man, you know, the garbage can, like the environment and nature is like in his wake, you know, getting out, getting away from him. Mm, Could be some allegory going on there. I don't know. Yeah, but go ahead and uh, set the scene here. I I think this was another pretty fun one. Yeah. So this this guy, again, the Coens are masters of character. I mean, the big Lebowski, uh, they just they do character so well and it doesn't take long. Uh, Instantly, this guy, you know, you feel for him. You know who he's he is, what he's all about. He's talking to the land. He's talking to the hidden gold. You know, he's he's he knows he's looking for it. And you just get a sense of who this guy is. And it's fantastic. I mean, so this guy's a this stud entrepreneur kind of guy. He's a fantastic prospector. He's not inventing something, but he's doing the best he knows. He's really good at it. He knows how to find gold. And so he goes out into this valley and he starts digging holes and he's panning what he finds. And he eventually narrows it down to where he thinks this big score is and what do you know you know he does and he he's kind of living and surviving in this little valley as he does it he's sleeping out in the open sky and he's taking a fairly big risk i mean bears could come along a mountain lion a cougar could come along and um well something far worse does come along far worse does come along man so he waits until he finds the big score and up comes this dastardly villain guy what does he call him a mean old skunk or whatever a dirty skunk i love the old timey kind of insults in these movies too fantastic and this ugly old skunk just shoots him in the back just shoots him in the back and the timing the timing that the the cohen's they really let you breathe into what's happening so the skunk guy shoots him in the back and then just sits there and slowly rolls himself a, a cigarette takes a few puffs on it and puts it into his jacket pocket and then he's you know scoots down into the pit to find out that the prospector isn't quite dead yet and there's a bit of a scuffle and the prospector gets the gun and shoots the guy in the head. And um, yeah, I, I, you can't fault his behavior in any way. I would have done the exact same thing. And he owes no obligation to, you know, drag his carcass back into town and find out, you know, who his family was or whatever. I would throw him in the hole and say, there you go. That's what you earned, buddy. Yeah. I mean, he was attempting to murder him. He thought he murdered him um, and he was wrong. And so, yeah, he ended up being defensively shot like he paid 
for he paid the price for his actions. The consequences were dire, and that was the end of that. And now, was he? Is that what they um, would consider a claim jumper, or is claim jumper just someone taking your claim, like when you're away? So this is more of a. I mean, it's no, like, claim jumper is a TV dinner, I think. <laughs> But no, yeah, that's, I think that's where you were away. They come and they work your land and then they're digging in it and they steal your, you know, whatever gold minerals and whatever. And then you come up and you're like, Hey, that's mine. And they're like, no, it didn't. All you're right. Playing jump up. So this is a bit more advanced and more, more direct. I think this is a little more extreme. I think the Coens took that concept to the extreme. Yeah, I doubt this happened a whole lot, but it's possible. I mean, it, there's a ring of truth to it. So it seemed believable to me that somebody would shadow a, a prospector, let him do all mm -hmm. the work. And it was right. a crap ton of work. Like he was digging all these yeah. holes. He was out there for probably weeks. Yeah. Hard labor. Um, Backbreaking back breaking work. And he was he was zeroing in on where this gold was. So he had, like you said, this very definite knowledge about where this would be based on the results of what he was finding. And, uh, you know, he was panning it and he was like, oh, there's four flakes in this. So he'd move another direction. No, there's 15 flakes, almost enough to keep, which I thought was kind of, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess gold seems more like if I found 15 flakes of gold, I'd be like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Good find. But, you know, back then, uh, probably not, you know, that wasn't like sufficient really for, I mean, he, he's weighing how much effort he's putting in, right? To, well, this isn't enough to make it worth my time. So I'm, I'm just using this as a means to an end to the, the big vein that I know is out here somewhere. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, this one was a lot of fun. I appreciated that, you know, he had his relationship with his donkey <laughs> and his relationship with the gold and that he took, you know, absolute, he's completely outraged by the guy stalking him and shadowing him and then shooting him in the back because that is just like the lowest thing right as a man as any kind of human being that just seems like the lowest behavior that someone's just going to sneak up on you and shoot you in the back and steal all your stuff that just that just gets at you right gets you right in the in the giblets of 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 the lowest kind of human behavior, but it seems like, you know, if there's some desperate guy, I could see someone doing it. Yeah. The chortles of my anger. Yeah. Now he, he was also upset because he was like, you let me do all this work and then you come and take this. But it wasn't all the work just yet. He had just found the nugget, but there was still a lot of work to get it out. And right. this guy, it's uh, Tom Waits was the actor. Um, he is a bad ass. Like he's been shot and he, tries to mend himself and then he continues to work the claim yeah right i mean luckily it goes it's a through and through shot it only just hits guts he says nothing important but still you got to imagine i mean if this is a real situation and especially at your advanced age you're it's going to take you months to fully recover from that gunshot and you're yeah you're just like a few days later maybe if that maybe one night sleep and then you're back out huffing and puffing and digging nah, this guy's a badass yeah now what did you make of the owl when he was um fishing for his food and then he climbed the tree to get the eggs and the owl like saw him doing it and so he backed off and he was like well mate you know I, i'm not gonna take all three maybe maybe just one or two yeah and then he puts then he's just like okay just one and then he's like well how high can a bird count anyway <laughs> that was a fun line nodding back to the chicken that was great but yeah, I mean, you know, he felt bad. He felt bad about stealing the young of this bird that he appreciated. You know, he felt, yeah. I, I don't know if I would have felt bad about it, but it seemed obviously not the thing that he was, he didn't necessarily need the eggs. It was more of a luxury item, right? But still, I, I don't know. I'm yeah, okay to, with it. To have something different than fish. Yeah. Yeah. And so then uh, he leaves the canyon and then the nature returns. So that's the nice close to that one. Yeah. Overall, strong. I liked it. Again, I, can't, I don't have any, a whole lot of uh, complaints about it. It seems like a kind of a short film you could do on a very, very low budget, like zero budget almost. You, you need two actors, a camera, and a donkey, <laughs> and a couple of supplies. Uh, it's great. You don't need a whole lot, and you can tell a great story. Yeah, and, and, and almost that entire one is a monologue, really. I mean, it's a, it's a one-man play for the most part until the, uh, the claim jumper guy. Right, and he doesn't have any dialogue. So it's really, and it's not even a whole lot of dialogue from the, the, the prospector. So it's a lot of um, just direction and cinematography. All right. Well, that's uh, that's good for number four out of six. We got two remaining and uh, we will we'll, uh, need to move along, mosey on down the trail a little bit further. I think to your favorite, I'm going to guess your favorite one, the gal who got rattled. Well, this is the most kind of complete story one. Um, and I guess it, it is my favorite. It's the one that stuck with me the most. It's, it's you know, it's a tragic story of um, kind of a love story, but there's some fun meat in it. Um, I do want to talk about the dog. There's a fun line about there's the issue of this barking dog. So these this brother and sister are heading out onto the Oregon Trail 
on the prospect of meeting a guy out in the Willamette Valley who is going to marry the sister. He'd be a business partner for this brother. The brother, right. But the brother dies suddenly on the trail. Like just, he's fine one minute and the next morning he's dead. And the dog, but before he dies, before he dies, there's a complaint that the dog is barking dog. And they're like, this dog is a barking dog. He's making too much noise. And the brother goes, well, it's a property rights issue. My property is, this dog is my property. My, my property barks. And that's just the end of the story. And I just want to mention that this is not exactly how property works. Um, if this dog is barking an unreasonable amount, it could be said that the dog is making a nuisance of itself and that there is a certain expectation. And I'm not saying that everybody has a, a right to silence or whatever, but I could see in like a, you know, a, a free market situation where this dog is behaving in an unreasonable way. And I don't necessarily have the best solution. The solution proposed in the story is once the guy is dead, well, we're just going to go ahead and put this dog down. I'm not completely against it. Um, the property they, owner is dead. What are the, they? The, the sister. <laughs> yeah, right. This is this guy cop. <laughs> um, but I didn't, you know, I, due to the necessity of the situation, I don't feel bad about that dog getting shot. What do you, what did you think about that? How did you feel about that, Daniel? How did it, did it hit you in the feels? Uh, a little, I mean, yeah, I feel bad. My girls love dogs. I mean, they're big into Paw Patrol and they want their own dogs. And so anytime, and, and you, especially, I think you're this animal loving. I'm a bleeding heart animal lover, by the way. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, for you to say, oh, I don't mind this dog getting shot from being for being a nuisance is quite a bit surprising to me. Um, but I think that the, the, the sister, the surviving sister, didn't really have the capacity to deal with keeping that dog. Now that her brother's dead and he's got the wagon, and he's got she's got this um, disgruntled uh, employee guy. Employee guy who's like trying to take advantage of the situation. It sounds like, especially when she relates to them. And, and forgive me if I'm moving us to the no, other. That's fine. Go ahead. But the guys that she talks to about it are like, whoa, he, he said that you're going to pay him this much. That that seems pretty high. <laughs> you know, like you're getting ripped off pretty big here. Yeah, four hundred dollars. But then then it's kind of revealed that her brother wasn't uh, that savvy of a businessman. He was a bit uh, gullible and and uh, not successful. Like he would get himself into situations where he would overpay for things and and not actually see the benefit of whatever he's trying to do. You know, he's, his, his eyes are bigger than his stomach in, in regard to what he's trying to take on. And I sort of related to this a little bit because I have like 15 different projects going on all the time. And because I can't devote the time to them, I feel like not very many of them are all that successful. Uh, so that, that part hit Daniel, me. Daniel, are you afraid you're going to die of like whatever it was, cholera in the middle of the night or whatever it was? Yeah, he, he did die from the, uh, the old cholera. Yeah. Um, I hope not. I certainly hope not. Uh, but it does make you realize and that, that you got to focus, right? You got to focus on just a couple of things and get pretty good at them. One good idea taken to its full completion is better than a thousand great ideas unfinished. Right. Or, or, you know, like have a dozen things you're pretty good at, good enough to, to provide value to others. But, but don't stretch yourself out so far that you're not very good at very much. Yes. Anyway, anyway, so she's confiding with these guys who are taking a shine to her to kind of, well, the one, the younger guy is taking a shine to her, the boss of the cattle train, or was it called the wagon train, wagon train yeah. boss? He's like having none of this. He's like there to sort of help, but he's like, I don't want to deal with this. So he's no, nah, he doesn't. Yeah, he's not there to get involved in all the drama of the whatever. He's he's been hired to get people to Oregon. That's that's his job. Right. And he's been doing it for what fifteen years, something like that. And this other guy has been like working with him for a few years, like helping out and like learning the ropes and that kind of a thing. And he's sort of at that age, and he says this to her when he sort of takes a shine to her. Um, that he's at that age where if he wants to settle down and have a family, he's got to make that decision pretty soon before it's kind of too late, you know? Certainly. Yeah. They're facing it. And he's a significantly older than she is. I get the impression that she's like young, like 20 or so, and he's like 30, 35 or whatever. But yeah, he's getting to the point where he needs to find somebody or do something. Otherwise, otherwise he's going to end up like his partner, like an old man sleeping on the ground. And he's not, not too excited about it. Now I do want to ask you, what did you think? Cause she was kind of facing kind of a moral question. Does she admit to her employee that she has no money or does she keep deluding him and have him continue to work for her for free till they get to this, what Fort Laramie or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. So this was because they buried her brother apparently with his money on him. Right. Not not a smart move. You got to go through the pockets, people. That's what you got to do. And they were already like a day's ride away. And, and they didn't think they'd have a way to, you know, go back and find the body and dig him up and get the money. Right. Because they weren't exactly like marking the graves because, you know, why would you? 
Right. And I even think they said, do you want to have a marker for him? And, and she might have said, no, I, I forget exactly. But yeah, that is a, a challenge because you've hired this guy and a, apparently there's an agreement in place. The guys you've confided in don't really believe that that agreement is truthful, right? They think that he's taking advantage of the situations and inflating the price because it's some, forgive the, the term, but some dumb woman. Like she won't know any better. So I'm going to say, you know, oh, it's 400 instead of 100 or whatever the amount was. Right. Cheap. But again, it, we don't know because the brother, like we said, may or may not have made such a poor, <laughs> a poor offer. Right. He very well could have. We don't know. Right. So I think that the solution was pretty good from the guy who was like, hey, I'll marry you and I'll assume this debt. And he needed that day to figure it out. And he's like, let the guy work for you for one more day and I'll try to, I'll come up with something. And he even tried to talk to the, to the worker and be like, hey, this doesn't sound right. And he wouldn't budge. Right, now that frees her from having to make this kind of moral decision. But what do you think? Because I tend to think that she should have been upfront with the guy. Like, hey, we don't have the money to pay you. Sorry. Will you please continue? Or if you can't, I understand it and I'll figure something out. But continuing to defraud the kid out of getting paid at all is pretty scummy. I mean, granted, it's not an optimal situation, but... Yeah, it's not optimal. Now, he had already said to her that if she doesn't pay him at Fort Laramie, he's out and he's not going to Oregon. So his offer was essentially, I'm getting you to Fort Laramie and you better pay me. And that's when it's going to come to a head. Which is a fairly generous thing, I would think. Even though he does feel a little scummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he might be a little scummy, taking advantage of a situation, but it's a voluntary association. I mean, you know, no one's holding a gun to anybody's head. Yeah, but, you know, we've talked about contracts and there's always a way out. You know, that's kind of like there's penalties and there's there's ways out of it. I mean, that was, that was his way out. Like, if you don't pay me, I'm out. I'm leaving. And right. so that was what his... He was offering to her at that point. And so her having him, you know, sort of in the dark for an extra day, and it probably would have been longer had uh, the guy who was taking a shine to her not, um, not come up with his plan. Like she probably would have withheld it from him all the way until Fort Laramie. Most definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what I would have done. I mean, maybe approach him and been like, hey, you know what? When my brother died and we buried the money with him, it's a terrible situation. I, I realize I owe you this money. I will try to raise it for you. Oh, you know, pay you when we're in Oregon or whatever, you know, raise, raise the funds or reach out to other people in the wagon, trying to figure out a way to, to solve that. Because, you know, there's, there is an outpouring of support for people who have tragedy to strike, you know, strike them. Right. And so that might've been, and I'm not saying people are obligated to do so, but I'm just saying that's like a condition, like that's how things kind of, kind of work. And, and they're, they're in a sense, a community in this wagon train and to, have not reached out beyond the the young guy that she was talking to. I think that if he didn't, if if he hadn't had that kind of idea, that solution, then maybe she could have reached out further into that group to try to solve this issue. Yeah, I think in in a real life situation, there would have been multiple options that would have appeared or been made available with all that. I mean, they showed several shots where the wagon train is quite long, quite extensive. And we're talking like 50 families, maybe more. And then like you were saying, you know, once we get to Oregon, you know, I, you know, I'm going to marry a guy. Uh, he could, you know, pay you or I could work for, you know, X number of time. I mean, I know it's not ideal, but I could pay you back. And I've there got all a, kinds wagon, of options. a wagon load of stuff here. I mean, what's in there? Right, man. All kinds of all kinds of options. Yeah, so, offer him some of that stuff, or sell that sell some of that stuff. You know, who knows? Yeah, or maybe there's more other uh, you know intimate arrangements that can be achieved. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, he didn't seem like a likable guy, but yeah, I mean, it's possible. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that's ever happened. Yeah, and and had he been likable, then maybe they could have built a relationship like she did with the other guy. But anyway, um, that's not what ends up happening, by the way. <laughs> well, None of that happens because yeah, the extra meat in this sandwich. Let's get into this. Yeah, so the dog is found because we are all of a sudden the the lady is missing and it's not the the prospective husband to be that notices this but it's the other guy and all of a sudden we find out the other guy is can actually talk i mean up to this point he's basically disgruntled but um yeah he finds her and she has found the dog and the dog is barking at these little prairie dogs now the dog the dog the guy tried to shoot him but he's not a good shot and he just scared the dog away right but the dog like trailed them Sort of like, you know, the Homeward Bound style, like follow their master kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, because what else is the dog going to do? I mean... Right, it's out in this he, ocean of just grassland, you know? It's this little terrier. I mean, it's not going to hunt a whole lot. There's coyotes, there's wolves, there's any number of things that's going to kill it. So, But, but yeah, the the, just, the gruntled, grizzled guy finds her out there with the dog and the prairie dogs barking away, yipping at him. 
And the prairie dogs, you know, they're cute, popping their heads up, whack-a-mole style. Yeah, and then there is a Comanche attack, or we assume Comanche, I don't know, under some other tribe, we don't know. And it's a strange kind of an attack. They kind of, it's they're you know, they vastly outnumber this one guy, but he's got a, like a Remington lever action rifle, and they've got bows and arrows, or do they also have rifles? I don't remember. I think they, uh, they had a mix of both. And okay. they, they also had the terrain between him and them, and the prairie dogs play a key role in that. Yeah, so they have all these holes where you don't necessarily want your horse running in and breaking an ankle. So they can only do certain things, but they're attacking, and he's able to fend them off. But in the meantime, he has told this girl that you do not want to get captured by these people. So if things turn bad and I'm killed, you know, here's a gun and put one in your own head. And so he ends up fighting them off. But at one point, it does look like he's down for the count. And we find out that that's what happened. And uh, yeah, it's really sad, kind of heartbreaking. And it's just a powerful story. I, I don't know. This was the most complete story for me. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, because he returns back to the wagon train. And he's and, you know, each each of the little uh, stories ends with a page of a book. And it reads, you know, he, he doesn't know what he's going to say to the yeah. young guy. It's like, I, I got no idea what to tell you, buddy. Sorry. I know you just had this whole idea of what you're gonna, your, your new life was going to be. And uh, anyway, uh, so uh, you want to do another wagon train? Yeah. Sorry about that. He had just confided in him that this might be his last wagon train because he's going to ask to marry this this girl. And it looks like that's kind of, you know, the plan that's going to happen. She Does she actually say yes or, or do we not get to that point? We, we, we understand that she is inclined to say yes. She doesn't actually say yes, but we understand that she's going to say yes. Yeah. Right. And and at the beginning of the, uh, the Indian confrontation, um, you know, he does offer them peace. You know, right. Yeah. He's yeah. like high waves at them and they're like, nah, we ain't, we ain't down with the highs. Right. And, and his, um, his, his point to that was, you know, because it's just the two of us, we look vulnerable. Right. Because they wouldn't risk attacking, you know, that wagon train of 50 families. I mean, there's right. Every, all the, everybody's armed with rifles plus the, the, the trail bosses. And yeah, it just wouldn't have gone as well. Plus you can circle the wagons and fire out defensively really easily if you got the time. Right. Yeah. And this one was, uh, was quite sad. And, and I mean, when he, uh, when the grizzled guy does get knocked down by the guy with the hatchet who was like hiding on his horse. So it just looks like it's the horse running at him. And then he pops up, reveals himself and whacks him. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it looks like, yeah, he, it looks like he killed him and he's about to, um, scalp him. And then, uh, the guy isn't dead and isn't knocked out and defensively, uh, shoots the guy. So, yeah. But, but yeah, it was enough for the girl to think, Oh, that's it. Um, I, it's unfortunate, and, and it is the story, but I, I would hope that in a real-life situation that she would have waited until, like, they're imminently close, you know? Right, yeah, yeah, that kind of surprised me. I mean, I know that it's, they're telling a story like you say, but if it was me, and clearly it's not me, but I probably would have waited until, A, you know, I'm, I'm down to, like, one bullet, I guess. I don't know if there was just one bullet in the gun or... You said two. Two, okay, so, you know, maybe wait until he's on top of you and then shoot him but or you know yeah i don't know i would have at least defended myself i would have gone down swinging um but yeah she she preemptively ends her own life real quick yeah and it's sad but it it does you know open and close the the story um yeah in, but in the, what, what is this your favorite one or what did you think or we, maybe we can finish we'll do the last one and then we'll see which one's your favorite all right well let's do the last one we'll do the mortal remains which is number six and one of the quirkier side of things but one i actually didn't like all that much this I was, was almost kind of ready for it to be over at this point. This is my least favorite one. And, I, and it, it makes no sense. I, it, it, it's strange. I don't even know why it's a part of the, the movie. Because this one doesn't have anything in it, really. There's really like not any like meat. There are you know a whole bunch of different characters. Like They're great about characters. They're, they're such studs at characters. It's almost like they wanted to go, well, let's put six different really weirdo characters in one carriage together and just have them all bouncing off each other. So in that sense, it was kind of entertaining. but. There wasn't any kind of like driving narrative. Like what happens? They get to this place and they go to the hotel and that's it. There's nothing, nothing to it. Well, they're bouncing off each other in sort of a philosophical, like their outlook on things. And they're all kind of countering and one-upping each other. Right. So there's the trapper who thinks that people are either what city folk or no, they think he thinks people are all like badgers or beavers or what does he say? Yeah. They're all like animals. Yeah. And then the, the lady thinks people are either sinful or sinless or whatever or upstanding or sinful 
And, you know, they, yeah, they're all talking about their philosophical outlook on life, which is a fair amount of interesting. I mean, it kept my interest, but I wouldn't say that it was particularly compelling because there's nothing there's nothing that was happening. Nothing happened. You know, I, I know you've watched this a couple of times, but maybe just watch this one and pay attention closer to the dialogue. Because when the trapper presents his very simple model and then the woman presents her very religious driven moral model, but then Renee, the French dude, is like, no, it's human experience is subjective. People value things differently. And I think that that, at least from my perspective, I see a lot of Austrian economics in that one. Fair. Fair story. Okay. I mean, yeah, he does use a lot of, you know, do you even know if your husband ever truly loves you? Can you ever really, truly be sure? And he tells the story of him playing another guy's poker hand and saying, well, I, I couldn't even do it. I couldn't because how you, a man bets is everything that is a man. It's all wrapped up in who he is. So I wouldn't even be able to play his hand for him. I wouldn't know what to do. And in a way, you know, he's right. I mean, in a way, I'd say that he's probably the most right of any of them. But then the, the story ends with these two bounty hunters and one guy singing a song and another guy kind of short, quickly telling a short little story and then talking about the legitimacy of being a bounty hunter or not. And then it's over. And then they go into a hotel. Yeah, that know. was weird. I, it, this one I thought was like more mystical, like like the bounty hunter guys were like going to be ghosts or dead or something weird, you know, something real quirky. Like, it would have matched. It would have bookended the story, right? Like if the first movie is like a the first bit's a cartoon and the last bit's kind of like this philosophical bit, you'd think there would be some kind of twist to it. Right. To really because, bookend and finish it. Because the other three in the in the cab are kind of freaked out by them. You know, they've got a dead body up on the roof of the carriage and they drop him down and bonk him on the ground and, and all that stuff. And then they're all like nervous to get uh, to go into the hotel. And the woman is like... Um, uh, she, they say ladies first. And she's like, well, I, I must be helped out of the cab or out of the carriage. Right. Yeah. It, you know, I, I, it seems like the most dense one. If you're can read into it and like see all this, because all of a sudden this, this movie explodes into dialogue. Like the first, like this one vignette has more dialogue than all the rest put together. Cause it's just all talking. And it's, it seems like there's something there that maybe I just didn't see. Like, I don't think the Coens would have put it in there without believing in it. And since I don't believe in it, it seems like it seems like a, a misfire to me, but it seems it must mean something to them to put it in there. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that if it were more of a standalone or even if it were earlier on, it would have been more. I think we would have viewed it better. But because it was at the end and it's so drastically different than the rest, maybe it kind of loses it a little bit. But I'm not wrong in saying that nothing happens, though. Oh, yeah, nothing happens. I mean, they <laughs> kind of get freaked out after a conversation. I mean, there are movies that are just all conversations that where you would say that things happen, like characters change and, you know, they have one opinion and they grow and all based on conversation. But I wouldn't say that anything happens in this movie or in this bit, this little short story, because there isn't any like character change. So there's literally like no change. It's just one guy saying what he believes and they go around the, the, the little ca cage carriage and then they get off and they all go their separate ways or whatever. They all go in the hotel. Right. But the bounty know. hunters do um, freak them out. Like, they're like, yeah, I want to watch them, you know, pass through that passage when they die. Like I, he enjoys watching people die. Yeah. And, are they, what is that an allegory to like the audience of watching all the death in the movie? I don't know. Yeah. He says, uh, cause he treats them like prey, right? He says, um, he likes watching them negotiate the passage and try to make sense of it. Yeah. Which I guess we're trying to make sense of. We are we're trying to make sense of what the hell that, that short story was about. I don't know. Whatever, for whatever, whatever reason it didn't hit me like the other ones hit me. So for that, I have to give it a, a negative review for that part. But overall, it doesn't taint my, my appreciation for this film overall. All right, it's, well, just, it's just easily my least favorite. All right. Well, let's get into that final summary review. It's about that time here on The Last Nighters. And this, again, is episode 61. You can find show notes more at lastnighters.com slash 61. So your summary and review, Robert. All right. Um, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs on Netflix by the Coen Brothers. What a what a pleasant surprise! That's the kind of fun thing about having Netflix is you're just one day you're hanging out and next minute there's this new movie to watch and you didn't even anticipate it because it's not like they go coming soon. Blah blah blah. I mean, there are websites you can go to to find out what's coming up to Netflix and what's leaving Netflix, but you have to like seek out that information. They don't advertise it, as far as I know. But yeah, all of a sudden, here's this Coen brother movie. Do you want to watch it? Sure. Here you go. And it's almost a masterpiece. 
as far as I can tell, uh, a whole lot of fun. Um, yeah, the first five vignettes are all hit me in the feels, not necessarily hit me in the feels, but you know, I connected with the characters. I you know, was engaged the whole time, like till the last one. The last one, I was like, what's even happening? I don't know. You're not giving me anything, anybody to really focus on or care about. There's no main character. Nah, there's just issues. But the other ones don't have that problem and it just shows their mastery of the craft and just instantly identify these characters and you care about them and what's happening. And man, I'm on board and just totally engaged the whole time. So not a perfect film for me. I mean, maybe if I watch this 10 more times and read some in-depth reviews and some philosophy on this movie explaining the last vignette, maybe I'll have a newfound appreciation and just think this is just a flawless piece of fiction. But uh, no, I got to give it a, I got to give it a really strong rating though. I have to give this like an 8.8, .8, maybe a nine. It's just, it just blew me away. And what a pleasant, pleasant surprise. I think this is probably the best Coen brothers film I've seen in a long time. Although almost all their work is like super fantastic. They just, they're, they are artists. These guys, they make movies like nobody else makes movies. I think they're the best working directors in film today. Um, and they just have a certain feel to their work that really works for me personally. I don't know if everybody else appreciates them on a certain level. You know, they just have a certain quirky way of looking at the world and a certain way to reveal information and to have their characters. That's just, it's just my style. It's just my jam. That's my Jimmy jam. So I dig them. I just dig them. I dig them hard. Watch this if you haven't watched it. And I hope you dug it the way I dug it. So enjoy. Daniel, what did you think? All right. So did you land on a nine or an 8.8 .8 or... You're going to average that out. Uh, yeah, no, let's just go with a nine, a solid nine. If, if, if the fifth one was as good as the wagon train one, you know, it'd probably be like a 9.4 or 9.5. I mean, it's that strong. This is like a top 20 film all of all time for me. It's that good. Wow. High praise. Wow. Indeed. And it's a series of short stories, but I'm a big short story lover guy. Like I, um, like Stephen King is released a couple of like his short story compendiums and those are like always the some of his best most exciting work like you know it's just it's like oh i get this really cool idea for this one thing and it's just going to be super cool and it doesn't necessarily need to be a really long thing and get all complicated and whatever it's just this one shot of a uh, really cool idea and here it is so it's it's fun and there's a good variety you know like you would say that all the different vignette stories were all very, very different, which is a lot of fun. But yet they all have the same essential setting. Yeah, there's a, a bit of a theme, just the genre kind of holding them together. But yeah, they're they're pretty distinct and unique uh, otherwise. And yeah, I think you're right. Like having them be individual short stories, it sort of forces them into getting the entire thing encapsulated in such a way to where um, you kind of get everything in a short period of time. And so there is a lot of satisfaction in that. And until that last one, because it kind of doesn't seem to have a point like we were talking about. But, you know, just in general, yeah, I, I think that the Coens are quite good and they definitely have a flavor of filmmaking that is very noticeable. Like it's, it's pretty easy to tell that their stamp is on this and uh, it's it's a good stamp. You know, they, they are high quality craftsmen at getting characters and, and story driven and, and having that kind of quirky uh, stuff. I mean, Lebowski is probably one of my favorite movies and, um, and I still don't know what it's about really, you know, if you really dig into it and we did an episode on it uh, a while back. I mean, it's, it's just kind of like they take some sort of like loose, loose storyline and then just run with it and have fun with it and go in all sorts of different directions and make it memorable. You know, like so many of the scenes, uh, stand out and, um, uh, high praise for them. So I'm going to go with like a, I'll go with an eight, 8.1 maybe on this. So a little bit lesser of a blown away by it than you. Um, I didn't, I didn't feel like the desire to go and watch it again two or three times. I might, now that we've discussed this a little bit further, I might go back and watch that very last one, The Mortal Remains, uh, again, just to like dig into what they're saying and the dialogue and, and see if there's more to it. And I think if it's just you're watching that 10 or 15 minute portion of it and not all the rest of the movie leading up to it, see if it plays differently. See if it's a little bit more uh, enjoyable in that respect. So I think that's what I'm going to go do. I might do it tonight, actually. Ooh. Well, two positive raving reviews from uh, The Last Nighters. What do you know? That hasn't happened in a while. Yeah, I'm usually hating on movies pretty big time. Yeah, our buddy Pat McFarlane from Liberty Weekly, we were uh, chatting with him earlier today uh, doing a recording, and, and he was like, oh, so Robert, does he actually like movies now? <laughs> 
I'm selective. I'm super selective. You know, sometimes I, I like I, I have high standards. The more movies you watch, you're just gonna generally you're just gonna get higher standards. You can't just be if you only watched one movie every ten years, then yeah, you know, it's the best movie I've seen in ten years. So you know, it's pretty good. But I watch a lot of movies, so I, I have to have high standards. All right. Yes. And speaking of Pat from uh, Liberty Weekly at libertyweekly.net, he does the Liberty Weekly podcast. Uh, We are going to be doing a show with him. He will be a guest for next week discussing another lawyer film because he is a lawyer. And so he's got to stick to his his uh, staying in his lane, stay in his lane. Uh, He knows his role, Jabroni. So we're going to do My Cousin Vinny, uh, which is, of course, the great Joe Pesci and I think uh, Marissa Tomei and the Karate Kid. Uh, That's the one he got the uh, Best Actress Award, right? Best Supporting Actress Award. Uh, Machio did? Uh, Tomei. Tomei. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think th- I think that is correct. I haven't seen it in probably 15 years, so it'll be a fun watch. Um, I know it's a comedy slash has a strong story and, and decent message in it, so I'm looking forward to that one. So next week, we'll be back with Pat McFarland of Liberty Weekly to do My Cousin Vinny. It's going to be a fun one. Tune in, everybody. Tune in and we shall tune out. Check it out at the Launchpad Media and at lastnighter.com slash 61. Good night from last night, everyone. In 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com.